Six to ten, y'all head on upstairs. Folks, I don't, I don't know if you really realize where you are this morning and who you are this morning, but you're, you're standing on, in sacred ground. You really are. Amen. You're a, a, a child of God. And so many came in here this morning with the, oh, well, you know, I'm almost like you're scared to sit down and, and you're scared to get excited about the Lord. And, and it's like a spirit of resistance in here. Well, I'm going to tell you the way to get rid of it. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. And I'm going to bring a message in Acts chapter 19 in a minute, but I'm not going to do it until we loosen this place up a little bit and we get a visitation by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to ask you a simple question, and I want you to shout it back to me. And I'll let you know when we are done. First of all, I want to know, who is the lily of the valley? Jesus. Oh, that's pathetic. <laughs> I've been in funerals where they did better than that. Who is the lily of the valley? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Who's the bright and morning star? Jesus. Who is altogether lovely? Jesus. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. Who is God the Son? Jesus. Can you do better than that? Who's the King of Kings? Jesus. And who's the Lord of Lords? Jesus. Then give him a hand this morning and welcome him in here. We've got to stop walking around defeated and destroyed and scared and weak. I've had more Christians this week tell me, what are we going to do when they close the grocery stores because of the coronavirus? Have y'all lost your minds? It's the flu for crying out loud. Everybody and the media is up there scaring people to death and Christians are buying into it and they forget that their Lord is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. He can stop a stupid virus if he wants to. Amen. There is nothing for us to be worried about. Everybody's in a panic over stuff that the media... You are really an idiot if you panic over what the media is telling you. You're an idiot. So hopefully you won't come out of here an idiot this morning. Now in Acts chapter 9, 19, we're looking at the things that the early church did. And until we get back to the power of the early church, we're not going to mount to a hill of beans for the Lord. We have got to start behaving like the early church did. We've got to start trusting God like the early church did. You know why? They had no plan B, no plan C. They didn't even have a plan A. They just did what the Lord told them to do. And they didn't worry about anything. You know, today we're worrying when somebody calls us a name. Oh, well, I'm, I'm deleting my Facebook account. I just can't please everybody. Well, thank God they didn't have Facebook back then or the 12 disciples would have all just went somewhere else. <laughs> People are so worried that the gospel is going to step on your toes. It is going to offend you. And I'm sorry for all my Baptist brethren that are watching on YouTube and on TV and all this, I'm going to offend you too. Amen. I'm a Baptist. I was ordained. I was licensed a Southern Baptist. God forgive me for that. I was ordained an independent Baptist. And then finally I got right with God. Amen. I'm just playing. But that, that actually was true all of the other things. But, I'm go but the Bible is going to hurt the feelings of everybody from every denomination. Because you're going to find something in there that you ain't never heard before or somebody told you you can't do that no more. Well, I like that because until we get to the point to where we don't care what a denomination tells us we can't do and then we finally stop believing what people have told us that God don't do this no more and God don't do that no more, then we can do something for the Lord. But as long as you're going to let people make you put God in a box and confine him and it's, and it's against this book right here, then you just might as well just sit still. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 19, it came to pass 
that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Paul was a church planner. He started off as a church destroyer. He started off as the enemy of the cause of Christ and then he wound up being the biggest church planner that ever lived. And let's say when God gets a hold of you, he will change your ways. And he found certain disciples and he asked them this question. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed all oh, the people are scrunching up now and all of y'all watching on TV getting ready to turn me off because I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> oh, well, we don't talk about that no more. We don't do that. Only them holy rollers do that. Well, we're going to roll a little bit here. Amen. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then he said to them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And he was the forerunner of Christ. He was making the path clear for the Lord. And, and there were a lot of his disciples scattered around that had not heard the gospel yet. And Paul said, John truly baptized with the baptism of the repentance, saying that they should believe on, on, on him which should come after him. i got to have some glasses. Lord, forgive me this morning, but I can't see. All right. Oh, yeah, there we go. And, and it said you should believe on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on, came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied and all the men were about 12. Oh my goodness. That's scary stuff right there for denominations, isn't it? The Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. If you don't have him, you can't do anything. You can't, you can't understand this right here. It makes no sense whatsoever if the Holy Ghost is not indwelling you. You can't make it to heaven. You can't do anything. The Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. Now, how do you get Him? You get Him by getting saved. You, you have to trust Christ. Not John the Baptist, but Christ. He said John the Baptist only repeats, preach, preached repentance but you got to take a step further. You've got to literally believe and trust Jesus for your salvation. When you do that, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And he will change you. He will give you gifts. He will give you power. He will give you the abilities to do things you never thought you could do. There are some of you sitting in here that you wouldn't be sitting in here if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost living inside of you. Some of you would be dead right now or in prison right now or whatever if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost living inside of you to keep you on track. Amen. And the rest of you that have never been saved, he brought you here this morning. Amen. Not me, he brought you here. So I want you to listen carefully because this message is for everybody. But we can't do anything without the power of the Holy Ghost. All the efforts all of the things we want to do won't happen unless you have the power of the Holy Ghost. He's still there today. He's still alive and well today. And he gives you gifts to do things. He gives you supernatural gifts. He gives you supernatural powers. Ain't nothing changed since the early days of the church except us. We broke off into denominations and one of them said, well, you can do this, you can do that, but you can't do that. And then some said, you can't do none of that. And they try to wish away all the gifts of the Spirit while there are still some people doing them. Yes. 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 There are still people today that are using the gifts of the Spirit. And I see them in here all the time. Now I'm dropping down here to verse 11. Now I'm gonna get really bad. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna make everybody real embarrassed. They gonna think I'm some kind of ignorant country hick that don't know no better. And they never been to a doctor. And you just don't do this no more, Dave. We've got hospitals, we've got doctors, we've got all of this and thank God for them. I'm grateful for that, don't, don't get me wrong. But there are times when that doctor can't do nothing. There's time when that hospital gives up on you. 
Listen to this. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Paul was so depressed at his condition at times that he threw up his hands and said, oh, wretched man that I am. So I want you to get it out of your head that Paul was better than you or that Paul was less of a sinner than you. Won't you get that out of your head right now? Because Paul said, I don't even feel worthy to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And he said, uh, God saves sinners of whom I am chief. He was worried about his struggle and he struggled to the day he died <clears throat> fighting that old self. Now I know nobody in here has had a problem fighting their old nature anymore after you got saved, do you? No. Oh, you're perfect. You're perfect. Now, one of the sweetest and godliest people in this sanctuary that I know is Marie Payne right there. Amen. Somebody got up in her face one time many years ago and yelled at her, said, you in the flesh. And Marie got up and said, oh, honey, you don't want to see me in the flesh. <laughs> they backed up real fast and exited the building. Because the old Marie could have come back and put a hurting on them. That's the same with everybody in here. The old so-and-so, the old Diane could come back. The old Martha could come back. I ain't never seen the old Martha, but I expect she's dangerous, won't she? <laughs> yes, sir, you don't mess with Martha. She's a warrior for God now. Roger, the old Roger. Roger's told me something about the old Roger. He was dangerous. <laughs> but anyway, Paul struggled. But God wrought miracles through the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he did. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Whew. Somebody get a, a handkerchief or an apron from Paul, and they'd take and lay it on somebody and they would recover. I'll never forget when Pastor Susie down on the Outer Banks was deathly ill. She's probably watching. And Susie, I'm gonna use you as an example. She was so sick that she didn't even remember that she had church that night. She was so sick and so Donna and I did the service for her. But she was really, really sick. But before we went down there, old Larry Smith. Anybody remember Brother Larry Smith? Probably one of the most humble, godliest old men you ever met. He was a church of God of prophecy pastor. And of all things, he would come here and sit where Debbie's at and shout every Sunday. And I asked him, I said, we're about as different as night and day, brother. What in the world are you doing up in the Baptist church? He said, because God told me to come down here and be your cheerleader. And he was. Amen. Well, Larry gave me a handkerchief that had been anointed with oil and prayed over. He said, take that down there with you. Don and I went down there and we laid that on Susie. And I mean, she, like I said, she was so sick. She couldn't even remember that she had church that night. And we prayed over her. And we left the next morning early to come home. And I called her the next day. And I said, Pastor Susie, how you feeling? She said, oh, I'm back up on my feet doing my work again. Amen. Don't tell me that that doesn't work. You can call it spiritual voodoo all you want, but it's right here. It's right here in the Bible. Down there at the Outer Banks, they have a group of women that sit together and they crochet or knit or whatever it is they do and make shawls. And they anoint it with oil and pray over it and they send it out to everywhere, particularly to cancer patients. And a lot of people have been healed because of praying and faith in God and they put one of them prayer shawls on. Now you can call it what you want, but it's Bible. It's about, the Bible said, as we were listening here in Mark 16 this morning, that when Jesus said, when I go back, I'm going to, to leave you with signs that you're going to do, that people are going to do this and people are going to do that. And it said, they shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Yes. Now, what part 
Of that do we not understand? Now, I understand that when your time is up, you're leaving this earth no matter what. But there's a lot of people that's missing out on healing because they don't trust the Lord. They haven't, they, they don't believe that none of this stuff works anymore, and so they've tried everything in the world. But I'm telling you, the other day there was a young man in the hospital. A whole lot of people have been asking for prayer for him. 25-year-old young man went into a deep coma from an overdose. The doctors called the family in. They said his organs are gone. His liver won't function, his kidneys won't function, he can't move. They said there ain't no brain activity. They said that it's just a matter of time. Well, some folks went over there, laid hands on that boy and prayed. Just a simple prayer, Lord, wake him up. Let him recover and let him be a testimony. Amen. This morning, the liver's working, the kidneys are working, and he is awake right. and talking. <laughs> there was a young man down on the Outer Banks that was declared brain dead, about the same age, a few years ago, last name of Gray, local family. Completely brain dead, no activity whatsoever was showing up. And people went and laid hands on the boy and prayed in the hospital. And I called the pastor and I said, how is Mr. Gray doing this morning? And she said, here's the phone, you can talk to him yourself. He's sitting up and eating and talking and doing everything. He recovered, he recovered. So I'm here to tell you don't ever disbelieve this word right here because it still works today. And until the church gets back to the ways of the early church and starts believing this, we really can't do much for God because we're putting him in a box. Now, here's a warning to people that are trying to do God's work without knowing the Lord. It's a dangerous thing. A dangerous thing to try to to do the work of God without the power of the Holy Ghost because you're, going to, you're in for a rude awakening and a scare. If you want to serve God, you better be saved. You better be walking with him. Listen to this. Then certain of the vagabond Jews who were exorcists. We all know what an exorcist is, don't we? Every, some of y'all have even seen that old horrible movie. I, I confess I ain't never seen that thing. I, I ain't never watched it. There are exorcists today as well. They took, it, they took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits. They were trying to cast demons out of somebody. In the, uh, in, uh, e they were trying to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus saying this. Listen to this. We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. They didn't know Jesus. They were never saved. They did not have the Holy Ghost living inside of them, and yet they were trying to cast demons out. And there were seven sons of one named Siva, a Jew, and he was chief of the priests which did so. Seven of his sons were gathered around this demon-possessed man. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? You know what you need as a church? You wanna reach this neighborhood? You wanna see more people get saved? and you want to see more people get right with God, you got to get to the point to where the demons know who you are and are scared of you. Amen. They know you by name and they are scared of you. Did you know that demons tremble at the name of Jesus? They are scared of him because they know what he can do and they need to know what you can do because the Holy Spirit lives within you. Anybody that doesn't believe that demons are real, you're on your way to hell. I'm gonna tell you that right now because they got you already. Amen. Smartest thing the devil ever did was to convince the world he did not exist. And there are people today that don't believe. Several years ago, the very second in command of the Virginia Department of Corrections, the highest man up the ladder, pulled me aside because he worked with in corrections all his life. And he said, brother, I'm gonna tell you a little something. Prisons and jails 
and programs will never work until they are ready to recognize the existence of a personal devil. And he's right. That's the only answer for the crime problem. That's the only answer for the drug problem. Why do you think the method has gotten out of control around here? Everybody is taking a drug that they know is going to kill them. Why would you do that? Why would you fool with a drug that always has a sad ending? It is no difference than if you took a revolver with three rounds left in it and stuck it under your chin and pulled the trigger six times. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. But you've got to have the power of the Holy Ghost. You've got to have that to overcome these things. That's the answer. That's the answer. The demon said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? They've got to know your name and they've got to fear you before you can do anything. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, overpowered them, and they ran out of the house naked and wounding. How embarrassing. Seven men trying to cast the demons out of one and they all got their clothes torn off of them and beaten up and they ran out of the house, wounded and naked. Or naked as we say around here. That's pitiful. But they didn't know the Lord. Don't ever think you can go up against demonic forces if you are not saved and you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Buddy, you better not ever because you're going to bring something home you can't get rid of. I'm going to move along quickly. It said fear fell on everybody when they saw that. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And I'm going to finish up with this. Many of them which use curious arts brought their books together and they burned them before all. And they counted the price of those books and they were 50,000 pieces of silver. Folks, if you want the power of God on you, what you need to do is get the devil out of your house. That's right. You need to look through your home and see what you got. You need to look and see what your kids have. And you need to clean your house. If you've got occultic symbols, demonic symbols, you need to get rid of them. Somebody gave one of my children many years ago a deck of tarot cards. I didn't throw them away. I took them out in the yard and I shredded them and I poured a can of gas on them and I burned them up and I prayed over it. Amen. That's what you need to do. You need to get the stuff out of your house that is evil, occultic, or anything that can open the door. If you've got a Ouija board, you better burn it. If you've got tarot cards, you better burn it. If you've got books on crystals, or you've got books on anything that is occultic, get it out of your house and burn it. Some of y'all need to see what your children are doing on their cell phones. You need to see what they're looking at. Because I'm telling you, pornography is an open sewer. You have an open sewer pipe pouring sewage into your home if anybody in there is looking at that garbage. You might as well be an old-fashioned parent and your children hate you but if they're looking at stuff like that and doing that on a cell phone, you need to get rid of them cell phones. I'm not going to tell you the old story that we had one phone in the house and it was on the wall and all that. I know that. It was on a cord. It was on a cord. I still have a flip phone. But I'm telling you, you need to get the garbage out of your house. If you have to cut off the internet, you've got to do what you've got to do. But it says they brought all of those things after they repented of it and they burned it. Whatever you've got to do to protect your home, I don't care if everybody gets mad at you, get it out of your house and burn it. And as a result, verse 20, and this is the last verse, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. I look around here this morning and I see the church 
beginning to grow. And I see people starting to come, but that's, that's not enough. The word of God has to grow mightily. And that means if we want to reach people, we got to get right with God. We've got to stop doing the things that he tells us is wrong in his word and start doing the things that are right in his word. And it all starts by some of you quit playing church and come and actually accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today and turn to him. And the rest of you to clean up your act and see where you've fallen short and make up the difference and get your home right with the Lord today. That's all that I have to say about this because I think I've said enough and I believe that the Holy Spirit is dealing with people's hearts this morning. So having said that, I'm gonna ask if everyone would stand and could we have our prayer warriors come down here? You know what your need is. If you've never been saved, you come down here and take one of these folks by the hand and they'll pray with you. You don't have to be part of this church to have that to happen. This is, 